Hello there, everybody. Welcome to Firehouse Talks with Jersey Rick, Igniting Leadership Excellence. I'm Rick Davis, and this is my co-host, Emily. Hello. Great to be back. Yeah, thank you, Emily, for joining me here once again. I sure do enjoy doing this with you. So episode you. number eight is called Navigating the Sea of Decisions. In episode number seven, we talked about a former Marine Corps Commandant, Al Gray, who passed away this March 20th. General Gray had been in the Marine Corps for 41 years, and one of the most commendable things I like to say about him is he was married to his wife for nearly 40 years. General Gray had a big impact on what took place in the Marine Corps, and one of the things I like that he instituted was the Marine Corps or the Commandant's reading list. General Gray was a brilliant man, and he understood the importance of reading and education. And, and hey, this is a plug for you men out there who are listening who say, I don't like to read. I don't need to read as well. You really do need to read. And these days with audible books out there, you could buy an audible book and, and you can listen to it and you can learn. So please don't run around with that excuse as, oh, I just don't, I just don't like to do this. And I think we should put in a shameless plug, plug, <laughs> plug <laughs> for your book is coming soon to audio. Yes, my uh, book is coming uh, soon to audio. Leadership development. Yes, for those of you who are, oops, we'll move this over here, who are watching this on YouTube, this is my book, The Furnace of Leadership Development, How to Mold Integrity and Character in Today's World, currently in print and in an ebook fashion. And as Emily just mentioned, waiting for word to come back from Amazon for approval of the audio book. Ooh. So by time this episode airs, it should be out there on audio. So thanks, Emily, for yeah. mentioning that. Of course. <laughs> so in the last episode, we covered the leader's or commander's intent. So let's remind our listeners what that's about. Yes, yeah, so the leader's intent or commander's intent Succinctly put, you know, I like the definition from the National Wildfire Coordination Group is the task, the purpose, and the end state. The task, what do we need to do? Mm -hmm. The purpose, why are we doing it? And the end state, what's it going to look like when we get through with doing this? Like the end goal. Yes, the end goal. That's, yeah. that's essentially what leader's intent is. So while you were a battalion chief at Loveland Fire Rescue Authority in Colorado, you had the opportunity to attend the Executive Fire Officer Program <laughs> <Lot of words. laughs> at the National Fire Academy in Emmitsburg, Maryland. So could you please tell us about that program and what it encompassed? Yes, it was a privilege to attend the Executive Fire Officer Program, and I'll refer to it in short, the EFO. Yeah, there's an application mm -hmm. process. You have to be endorsed by your fire chief, and there's an educational requirement to get in. And, and the reason being, and that educational requirement is a bachelor's degree. And, and yes, that does eliminate some people in the fire service who don't have it. So the reason why the National Fire Academy has it set up that way is because it's an accredited program. And the EFO can be credited towards a master's degree. So that's, yes, it does narrow down who can who can go. But when I went, it was a four-year program, and we spent two weeks on campus there in Emmitsburg, Maryland, right off of US-15, right on the Pennsylvania border, and just south of one of my most favorite places in the world is Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The campus mm -hmm. there, uh, the National Fire Academy, uh, it's beautiful. And I was fortunate enough to attend during the months of the year when it was green or getting ready to turn into fall. So I didn't have to go back in the winter months when everything was brown and there was uh, a lot of rain. So out of those four years, the four programs, year one was executive development. Year two was community risk reduction. Hmm. Year three, this one's a mouthful, executive analysis of fire service operations and emergency management and year four was exec yeah <laughs> year four was executive leadership 
So at the end, I coming into it, I knew that there was going to be a six month research project attached to this. It's like, well, that's cool. I, you know, I like research. I, I like writing. Obviously, we just talked about the book mm -hmm. that I wrote, which came along well after my time at the EFO. So I thought, great. Well, what I didn't know, but I found out that very first day at the EFO program was your research project had to be related to that particular year's class and it had to be related to a problem in either your fire department or your community so i'll talk a little bit more as that impact on my first year's research project the applied research project and you know you had to get a passing grade to be able to come back that following year or to graduate at the end so where this research comes into play for this topic here, navigating the sea of decisions, is my first year's paper, research paper, was called Making Rapid Tactical Decisions Under Stress. Mm. And then my third year paper was Situational Awareness at the Command Level. And just for those who say, hey, what'd you write about on year two and year three? Year two, because the class was community risk reduction, I wrote about the wildland urban interface threat in our jurisdiction here in Loveland, Colorado. And year number four was a paper regarding managing change. So that's what the EFO was about. In a nutshell, it was a great program. I made some great friends there. I had some great classmates and you know, the instructors were really good. It was just an absolutely fan, fantastic program, Emily. Yeah, and we had the privilege of going down as a family to see you graduate yeah. with some close family friends of ours. Yeah, so that was. That, that was, was really, great. That was really cool. Yeah. And I'll add, this isn't just any research paper. I mean, this was like, what, like 50 pages long? I averaged, Insane. <laughs> I averaged 55 pages in my research papers, yeah. I remember when you had come back to the academy or come back from the academy and start working on the research paper, you literally had a pile of stack of books like on a table, like that's probably taller than me. And you'd have to sequester yourself in the basement like for hours just writing these papers. Yeah, you're right. And I wanna <laughs> I wanna add in with that too, and for our listeners and those who are watching, I would do my internet research late at night in the fire station past our normal duty hours in those times when a lot of the a lot of the guys had already uh, hit the rack for the night that's when I would do my internet research uh, I will add also that I never wrote my paper while I was on duty I there was other things for me to do as a battalion chief so I would write off duty plus I want everybody to know I never wrote my book the furnace of leadership development when I was on duty I did not think that that was ethical chapter one in the book is on integrity we've already talked about integrity here on our podcast and so i've known people who have written their books while they were on duty yeah. but I, frankly i think that's an unethical practice and i was not going to be engaged in that yeah so uh talking about those topics that you um were talking about in the mm -hmm. efo what led you to choose the ones you did for those research papers? I really developed an interest in decision making after a live fire exercise that I conducted mm. at our training area in 2007. And hey, frankly, folks, that drill did not go well. It did not go well at all. And afterwards, as we were doing our after action review, I was fond of telling people, you know, think out of the box, think out of the box. Well, one of the captains who I had known for a long time said, what do you mean by think out of the box? Hmm. You always say that. Mm -hmm. I was stunned because I had, number one, made the assumption that people knew what that meant, think out of the box. Mm -hmm. Number two, I was even more stunned from the fact that I'd known this guy for a long time, you know, and he had never said anything until that day it was that particular exercise and him saying what do you mean by think out of the box that really propelled me into studying decision making and looking at the different models that were out there so i've been a student of leadership or excuse yeah leadership for a long time but in particular a student of decision making now for the last 17 years wow 
So during your research for making rapid tactical decisions under stress, that was the title <laughs> of your paper, right? Yes, that was the title <laughs> of my first paper. So what resources did you use? I used a lot. I take research seriously, and so does the National Fire Academy. And they take things seriously when you write your papers, too, is if someone plagiarizes mm -hmm. and it's found out, they go back to the student and they give them the opportunity to make it right. Was it a mistake that a quotation mark was missed, which the evaluator should have picked up on that themselves? Because lots of times the question of plagiarism is found when somebody else is doing research. So I was very meticulous in the research that I did and in how I cited that research as well. But overall, for that very first paper, I had 45 total resources that I was digging into uh, from the military, from the wildland arena, uh, primarily information that was coming out of the federal resources from that and several books written by civilians and documents. And as I was getting ready to wrap up my literature review and start my writing, one of the other battalion chiefs said, hey, Rick, I think there's a book that might help you. I just saw this. It's written by a gentleman, Dr. Rich Gassaway. He's up in Minnesota. And you know, Rich is a uh, retired fire chief from up there. Mm -hmm. And his book was called, is called Fireground Command Decision Making, Understanding the Barriers Challenging Commander Situation Awareness. And it was Rich's PhD thesis that he put into a book format. So it was finished reading that book. It was about somewhere around 9 30, 10 o'clock at night in the fire station. Ran downstairs to get a, I sent him an email and I ran downstairs to get a cup of coffee and I came back up and whoa, he wrote me back. But frankly, I was surprised because I've communicated with some other authors in the past and I, and it's like they totally snub you. Yeah. And it's all of a sudden they've written a book and they're too good for everybody, which, you know, I've never wanted to do that. You know, God gave me the ability to write a book, but I don't want to be that type of author is that I'm too good to talk, talk to you. People like that, frankly, ought to have somebody put a boot up there rear end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to become approachable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. So what was the result of those two research projects? They it was very and talking with Gasaway. Yeah. Too. Uh, well, and, and talking talking with uh, Rich Gasaway, he said, "Hey, you're going to be around tomorrow morning at nine thirty your time." And I said, "Yeah." He said, "I'll give you a call." They like, great. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and he actually did. That's and cool. so he listened to what I was doing. He's a graduate of the EFO as well, and so he was very supportive of what I was doing, and he gave me some information. And over the years, I've been able to sit in on some of his classes, uh, two, three, actually three of them here in Colorado, and then a, a couple at some national uh, conferences. And, and one of them, he said to me, why are you in here again? He says, you've heard this before. I said, yeah, you know, number <laughs> one, yeah, I like you. Number two is it's great information. Number three, it just reinforces what I already, I already know. So that's what the result of that was. Mm -hmm. But what was the result of those two research projects? Well, those two papers. And then in 2010, Loveland Fire Rescue adopted what's referred to as the blue card system. Now in the wildland arena, it's the red card system. So some who are firefighters that are listening to this, I'll be familiar with the red card and maybe not. Uh, some will be familiar with the blue card system and others never heard of that thing. The blue card system was adopted by or developed by uh, Alan Brunacini, who was the fire chief in Phoenix, Arizona mm. at, and at the time. He'd been there a long time. He began with Phoenix in the 50s and he was wow. the fire chief for some 27 years. And he passed away a couple years ago. And you may Recall, we had him here for a class and, you know, you and uh, mom and myself were able to take him out to supper. And he was just a very, very, you know, kind, kind gentleman. So we were adopting the blue card system. And there was four of us involved with that. Uh, three of the battalion chiefs and the fire chief. Two of the battalion chiefs 
were working on the actual implementation side of the blue card. And myself and the fire chief at the time, Randy Morawski, we were working on the decision-making side, the situational awareness side, because we wanted to introduce it as like a side-by-side -side railroad track mm -hmm. to our people. And we were going to roll this out first to our command staff to make sure that we were all on the same page with this. But as this time went on, after I del uh, delivered my portion to the members of Love and Fire Rescue Authority, that's when I developed this class now, Navigating the Sea of Decisions. It's going through you know, a couple different names, and I've delivered it in half-day formats, full-day formats, and then sometimes in extremely condensed methods. When I've been out in California, when Brian's had me out there and, mm -hmm. and, and I've delivered this in a, like I said, ex when I say extremely condensed, I mean extremely condensed method for hazmat incident commander class. And then uh, the classes, the other classes that I teach with Brian most recently, mm -hmm. the hazmat technician course. So the, those parts there was just like taking a little water can and sprinkling <laughs> it on the plant outside. So that's what the result was of those two mm -hmm. projects. Well, I really like the name navigating the sea of decisions mm. because when I think of things literally and the sea is like huge and decision making is just not an easy, most of the time it's just not an easy yes or no. There's a lot of things you have to evaluate and take into consideration or even do your mm -hmm. research to make yeah. a good decision. Now that, if I may interrupt you right there, that's in a non-emergency setting. Mm. Making rapid tactical decisions under stress is when the engine or the tower, truck, whatever terminology is used by a particular fire department or the battalion chief pulls up on scene, you're the first one on scene and is complete and total mayhem. Uh, image comes to my mind that I came in to, off duty to be a support officer for the incident commander is a multi-patient motor vehicle accident that occurred not too far from here on the U.S. Highway 34 overpass from I-25 when, <laughs> when a vehicle piled into a one of the commuter buses that takes people down to the airports, and that propelled that vehicle up on the back end of another car. That's rapid tactical decision-making. Those first in units, or none of us, can pull up and say, oh, Chad Willis, what do we really got here? Now, let's think through this thing. You know, let's take some time here. Now, you got to do it right now because there's a life threat that that mm -hmm. exists. But yes, Emily, you're, you're right. There are those other times where you can sit back. And we're going to talk about that just here a little bit more in a few minutes. Let's go deeper into your class. What are the core components? The core components of the class involve situational awareness, John Boyd's OODA loop, O-O-D-A, observe, orient, decide, act, which I mentioned back in the previous episode yep. about General Gray, and then a gentleman, Gary Klein, recognition, prime, decision-making. But let's jump back into the situational awareness aspect of it. There is a lady out there by the name of Micah Ensley, and she's got a company called SA Technologies. She used to be chief scientist for the Air Force. Now, Ensley has developed or recognized, identified three levels of situational awareness, mm -hmm. perception, comprehension, and prediction. And any one of us can be at different places along that three level area right there. What do, what do, we, what do we perceive? You know, what is taking place here? And, and I'll hold off there in that full definition for a moment. Coming back then to John Boyd's OODA loop, John Boyd was a colonel in the Air Force. And for the sake of time on this particular podcast right here, can't really delve into everything that John Boyd did to develop the OODA loop. But for the listeners and those watching right here, he was working through this during the time of the Vietnam War when the United States was getting a lot of aircraft shot down by the North Vietnamese. And, and I'll add a lot of their planes being fly, flown by uh, communist Chinese pilots and Russian pilots as well. That's a different story, mm -hmm. different podcast. Yeah, 
but I'll just throw I just throw that out there, you know, for the sake of throwing that nugget. out there. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, a little history nugget. So ultimately, what he developed was the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. It's still used today in the military. There's a number of law enforcement agencies that are using it. As I mentioned in the previous episode about General Gray, that elements of that were incorporated into the Marine Corps warfighting manual. Mm-hmm. And I taught it to my shift at Loveland Fire Rescue and taught it to the fire department and I've taught it to other fire departments as well. And even, even in the hazmat training that I've done. Now, Gary Klein, recognition prime decision-making really revolves around what, you know, we see because what we take into our minds is there. And one of those things that propelled Klein into this is the army approached him. And this was prior to the you know, actions in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. And they wanted to better improve the thinking, decision-making ability of their officers. So Klein thought, hey, where can I go? Well, I can go to the fire department. <laughs> and I, it was a Cleveland fire department in Ohio that he went out and he started doing research. Is, yeah. Hey, how are firefighters making these rapid decisions? So we take in and we develop these scenarios in our minds, or I shouldn't say scenarios, but it gets tucked away because the brain is incredible. God has given us incredible brains and this stuff gets tucked away back in our brains. And I said, I've seen this someplace before. Uh, Again, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to really delve into this in this particular episode. But for, hey, those of you, you know, who are listening, if you would like to know more about this particular subject, I'm going to give my website out at the end. You can go there. Um, I'd love to come to your organization and teach this. Or if you'd like to hear more about it on the podcast, send me an email at rick at fireofficerleadershipacademy.com and i can look at getting that plugged into a a future episode absolutely so uh one of the things i want to address about situational awareness is i've heard over the years people say especially in the emergency management field is well we're going to gather situational awareness well that that exactly doesn't mesh up with what micah ensley identified as situational awareness, perceiving what is around you, being able to comprehend what is taking place, that's understanding what is taking place. And then that third level, the ability to predict or project what is going to happen next. Mm -hmm. So it's a totally mental process and is completely different than saying, okay, well, yeah, the fire is located here. And in three hours, we protect this. We we project that this wildfire is going to go here. But these are the resources that we have here, um, and this is what we need. You know, it, we can't get those two. We can't get those two mixed up. Interesting. So this is all very fascinating information, and sounds like more than we can cover in this episode, like you said. So. Maybe we can do another episode to expound on this later on. Yeah, yeah, it w- that would Especially be that would be good. Awareness. Yeah, and I as we wrap this one up, a lot of people said OODA loop. Yeah, you know, John Boyd, and you'll see a lot of things out there um, that are misconstrued with the OODA loop: the observe, orient, decide, act. There's a lot of people that want to just try to say, oh, yeah, they, there is a circle because you you do it's called it's called a loop. But you can dig into this and you can look at it and Boyd's information is out there. Interesting thing that I will throw out here about John Boyd. He got on the outs with the Air Force because of the way that he kind of pushed things along. And the Air Force doesn't even own his material. Mm -hmm. The Marine Corps owns his material. Oh, interesting. And in a biography that Mm -hmm. was written about Boyd when he died, he's buried at Arlington National Cemetery, wow. there was only two members of the Air Force who showed up in uniform, but 40 members of the Marine Corps came up from Quantico wow. for his funeral. And so mm-hmm. yeah, the Marines at that time saw the value, and there is value in that OODA loop that is out there. Now, 
Mm -hmm. All right, next episode, number nine. It's going to be released on June 6th. That's the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Wow. June 6th, 1944, when Allied forces landed on the beaches in Normandy. And we're going to incorporate some of the elements from this episode here today and episode number seven into that. And I got a surprise for you about what we are actually going to be talking about in episode number nine. I bet you some of you already are going down a path saying, yeah, Davis, I know what you're going to talk about. I know what movie, I know what HBO series you're going to be talking about. You might be in for a surprise. Well, I can't that. wait. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're going to have to wait for the bi-weekly for it to yeah, come out. So yeah, that's right. They'll just have to stay on the edge that's of your right. seats. <laughs> so, hey, everybody, as we finish this up, Thank you for taking the time to join Emily and I and listen to Firehouse Talks with Jersey Rick, Igniting Leadership Excellence. This is a production of the Fire Officer Leadership Academy, and we can be found at www.fireofficerleadershipacademy.com. I encourage you to visit the website. And also, I will add in that you're going to find that there's a companion course that goes along with my book, the Furnace of Leadership Development. There are videos in there. There's a, a PDF copy of the book that comes with that course in case someone does not actually have the ebook, the audio book, or the physical copy of the book. So yeah, please check out my website and you'll see the services that I provide out there. So until next time, we'll see everybody. Bye-bye. So long. <laughs>